As promised, our NHL analyst Frankie Corrado is here with his thoughts on everything that happened Wednesday. was such a fun night in hockey. And, of course, you get the line brawl right off the top with the Rangers and Devils. We know the history going into it, Frankie. Are you surprised that all the players got involved, though? Are you surprised, surprised that it actually turned into a line brawl? Yes, I am surprised that it turns into a line brawl. But here's the way things start. Rempe owes McDermott a fight. Whether anyone likes it or not, you can talk about the code. That's the way it works. Rempe took out Bastion. He took out Siegenthaler. And after the hit on Siegenthaler, McDermott was there. He asked him to go. He doesn't go with him. Rempe owes him the fight. Now, at some point in this game, it was going to happen. I didn't expect it to happen right at the drop of the puck. So now that leads us to our next point. The starting lineups. Travis Green and the New Jersey Devils, they decide, or he decides, he's going to start his fourth line featuring McDermott. He has done that a lot in the past. I played for Travis Green, and when I played for him, he would try and get the team going a little bit. He'd come into the dressing room, and he'd say, boys, we're starting heavy tonight. And everyone just knew that was the fourth line. He didn't even have to announce the, the players that are on that line. So that's something he's done in the past. Now, the visiting team submits their starting lineup first. Then the home team sees it. They get to answer back. In this situation, the New York Rangers had an opportunity to defuse the situation and not put Rempe on the ice to start the game. They could have put their first line, their second line. You can put Panarin on the ice. McDermott has no interest in fighting anyone else other than Rempe. That's his guy. He understands that. So the New York Rangers put that line on the ice with Rempe. You get the fireworks that you got. It's great entertainment. It's under the bright lights at Madison Square Garden. Everyone, I think, is pretty entertained by it. But that's the way this goes down. The Rangers had an opportunity to defuse this situation. They didn't. And that's the result that we got. And is that, that's why I'm surprised at Peter Laviolette's reaction on the bench, Frankie. Because as you said, not only did he put Rempe out there, he had healthy scratched him the three previous games. It was very obvious why he was in the lineup. So you might as well get it over with right off the start because it's going to happen at some point. Why does Laviolette freak out on Green? Is it just the theatrics? I mean, Laviolette's been coaching since the 90s. No, the, my read on that is Laviolette sees the starting lineup that Green is putting onto the ice, and he sees McDermott. And he probably thinks, well, I'm not going to put any of my star players on the ice because I don't want McDermott or anyone on the ice for New Jersey taking unnecessary shots at someone like Panarin or Trocek or Lafreniere. Like, take your pick. But... Like I said, McDermott has no interest in any of those guys. There's one guy and one guy only that he wants a piece of in this game, and it's Matt Rempe, and he gets him two seconds into the game. I don't think any of those other players on the New York Rangers were in jeopardy of having to fight McDermott or face any kind of physical, unnecessary play. But I do believe Laviolette saw that lineup and said, well, I'm not going to put anyone in, in, in danger, for lack of a better term. I'm going to put my, my tough guys on the ice, and that's what we got under the bright lights at MSG. And uh, if, you, if you check out Twitter, everyone was entertained, to Frankie's point. Everyone loved it. So, uh, hey, it's hockey at the bright lights of MSG. Meanwhile, hockey at the bright lights of Scotiabank was not quite as exciting for the Toronto Maple Leafs fans. Bit of a dud against the Lightning. However, Austin Matthews, the silver lining, 63 goals, seven away from 70. Have we gotten to a point, Frankie, where it's Sheldon Keefe having to balance giving Matthews as many opportunities as he can to get 70, but also preparing him for the postseason, which Wednesday night the Leafs didn't necessarily look prepared for? You know, the best way to prepare him for the postseason, Jay, is to just keep playing him. Like, I don't know if the discussion of load management is going to come up for the Leafs down the stretch here, but under no circumstances should that even be a consideration for Sheldon Keefe and Austin Matthews' plan. If you're going to do something like that, what's your reason behind it? What's your purpose? You know, I, go to a different sport. Go to basketball. Kawhi Leonard and the Toronto Raptors, they had to do that because Kawhi had lingering issues. And if they didn't manage his workload, they weren't going to get him for the most important time of the season. 
Now let's bring it back to hockey. The Florida Panthers last year were desperate to get into the playoffs. They were playing very desperate hockey at this point in the season last year. Was there load management for Barkov? Was there any kind of workload management for Matthew Kachuk? No, those players were playing at the peak of their game at this point in the season. So for Austin Matthews, he should have every opportunity to play every game. He's going to get every power play rep. He's going to play good minutes in those games. So he's going to have an opportunity to get 70. But more important for the Leafs, Jay, he's going to have an opportunity to keep his game at the high level that he's at and go into the playoffs playing the best hockey of his career. Unfortunately for the Philadelphia Flyers, they're not going into the playoffs playing their best hockey, and John Tortorella has been very vocal about that. He's calling out his team a lot for a lack of effort, and it was interesting on Wednesday, Torts met the media and explained his criticism, and he also explained his coaching philosophies. Take a listen to this. It always comes down to, right, it always comes down to, oh, they're going to quit on him. It, it follows me around, it fo it fo and so be it. If a player is going to quit on me or players are going to quit on me because I'm trying to make them better people and better athletes, you got the wrong damn coach here and you got the wrong damn people here. So I'm not sure what goes on. My job is I am going to push athletes and um, I try to stay away from, uh, I have other things on my mind that I don't give you. Uh, I was in control the other night. What I said I meant and quite honestly, when I watch the tape now, I'm, I'm more concerned than just the second period because of I'm so proud of the team getting here. And, and I guess now the narrative out there is, because I've heard from other people, that they're young, they, they're not supposed to be here. Bull we're here. We're here. Face it. And let's be better. And I don't think we're ready to be better. And that's my problem with us right now. And it is my job. I have not done a good enough job to get them over the hump after playing those seven games. And then each game as it goes down, we have six left. I haven't done a good enough job to make them understand we have to be different now. We have to be at a different level. That's my frustration with me. And that's my frustration with the team. And if people can't handle it, so be it. Now, on our show yesterday, Brian Hayes criticized Torts for refusing to put the blame on himself. The funny thing is, Frankie, in that particular clip, Torts put the blame on, on himself quite a bit. Uh, my question for you, though, Frankie, as a former player, you hear that stuff constantly from Torts. How do the players respond now? How, how do you think this Flyers team will respond down the stretch as we head to the postseason? Jay, they're going to respond the same way that they would have responded if this didn't happen. Like, they're professional athletes. They're playing in the best league in the world. You owe it to yourself. You owe it to your teammates because of the position that you've put yourselves in to give yourself the best opportunity to not only make the playoffs, but do something when you get there. And I, Torts talked about it like, hey, people are saying we're not supposed to be here. They've been there all season long. It's a large enough sample size that, yes, there may not be the star power, but they've done something as a group that not a lot of people expected. And Torts is a big reason why that happened. And you can say what you want about Torts. There's some weird stuff that he says at times. But one thing is very, very evident with Torts. He cares about his team, his players for the right reasons. He wants to push them to be better hockey players. He wants to get the most out of them. And it's funny when you look back and you think how many times players have said something along the lines of, I wish I had torts when I was younger. Or when guys play for torts and then go, for some, go play somewhere else, then they realize he really wanted what was best for me. He really pushed me in all the right ways. And coaches can be demanding. They can be hard on you. One thing about Torts that always stood out to me is I've crossed paths with him like further down the road in my career and it will always was a, a handshake, a warm embrace, a, a, a warm conversation and like I think Torts has a lot of time for the people in his life, the people on his team and sometimes that gets miscommunicated but he's a very good coach and he cares about his players. Love it. Uh, man, Frankie, this has been so much fun, and we're going to keep Frankie around. Later in the show, we'll dive deep into the Canucks and Oilers games from Wednesday night.